everybody. I know uh, my videos don't normally start like this, but uh, the channel has grown a fair bit in the last couple of uh, weeks. Uh, yeah, two months. Um, and I guess some people watching don't know who I am. So very quickly, my name's Steve Mascord. You can hear if you're any good at English speaking accents. I'm Australian and I'm a journalist uh, by trade. I actually worked in newspapers in Australia and to a much lesser extent over here for you know, 30 years. I now live in London and although most of my journalism has been around the sport of rugby league, I also have um, some background in, in music journalism. I um, come up with the name Hot Metal Magazine, which is a big magazine back in the day uh, in Oz and here in the UK and uh, contributed to Kerrang! and Juke and On The Street and, and various publications like that. So I'm sort of tapping into that now with uh, these interviews. And today's chat is with Key Marcello, the former uh, guitarist with Europe. Before we have a listen to that interview, um, if you just uh, go up to, that's that's where it is, go up to the card there, um, there's an opportunity to support uh, us on Patreon. It's not just support. Uh, actually, what I'm going to do, which I don't think anyone else does here on YouTube, is um, I'll actually let people who uh, support us through Patreon dial in and ask a question with the guest live uh, in, in future episodes. So I actually offered that for the first time with this Key Marcello interview, but I didn't give anyone much of a warning. And also I'm going in future to put up archival stories of, um, anywhere else on the internet uh, up there and you get to see um, content like this uh, first and maybe a few outtakes and things like that. I've got like an absolute wealth of archival material going back to like 987, uh, which is just sitting in a storeroom. So uh, there's plenty of gold there for people. Um, anyway, thanks for supporting the channel. Thanks for like tripling, quadrupling, 10 times in our watch time in uh, the last 28 days and also for giving us 30 or 40 uh, new uh, followers. Um, it's, it's because A, um, you've been supporting it, but B, I guess I've been pulling my finger out of it and putting up content pretty much every day and I want to continue doing that. Okay, uh, let's start. There's other, heaps of other things I could plug, but I'm not, I don't want to blind you with that sort of stuff. So um, after this uh, little intro, King Marcelo. Welcome to uh, White Line Fever Live and if you're watching on uh, YouTube, I have to learn to say this all the time, you've got to hit subscribe and you've got to hit the bell so you know when there's a new interview coming up because otherwise, if you haven't done that, you would have missed this and if you're listening on the podcast, uh, welcome back. Uh, I've still got my headphones in but I'm, we're not talking to him on the headphones. It's Key Marcelo. Hey Key, how are you mate? Hey, how are you mate? I'm great. Great to hear from you now. This is always a challenge, right? Because you have done two days of press, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. A lot of people in back my part of the world in Australia. So I've got to try not to bore you by not asking the same questions everyone else is asking you. So I was just thinking, with the new, we're here to talk about your uh, new project, Out of This World. Uh, the album's out now. And people who are even have a passing interest in rock music will, will know that that title is taken from the Europe album of 1970, 19- no, you're not that old. 1988. <laughs> Thank 1988. you, <laughs> <laughs> um, Now, if you listen to those two albums back to back, Key, what would it tell us about the years since in music, in rock music? What do you think? Well, first of all, I think uh, the, the sound of records has developed over the years. Although it's Ron Everson mixing this album as well. But I, I think uh, even though it's, it's classic melodic uh, rock, melodic AOR. I think it has a modern touch to it, you know, for some reason. I can't put my finger on it. We're doing pretty much the same thing. And I'm writing pretty much the same song that I've writ- been writing since 1985. But mm-hmm. uh, uh, it comes out in a different way with the way you, you, you play nowadays. I mean, the band, um, the drummer and... and all that so but i think uh after this world this new band li- lives it, its own life i would guess because first of all the songwriting has a lot of uh, uh todd rundgren feel to it because i'm a big i'm a big soul fan as well i'm i'm, I'm more of a soul fan than a, a heavy metal fan to be quite frank so there's a lot of other stuff going on in the music and, and, and obviously the hooks has to be ever present on, on every song. Otherwise, it's not a song to me. I cannot just release a, a lick or a riff and say this is a song. It has to have some, the content is important to me. 
And one thing that's unique with this album, I think, is 10 good songs. What digital did to music, the bad favorite, the bad favorite did to music, to rock music, is our albums with two good tracks and the rest fillers. Mm -hmm. Because you concentrate on one or two singles on Spotify and the rest is just, you know, there to make it an album, you know, so you can sell an album later on. We wanted to have 10 really strong songs and I think we've accomplished that. Yeah, it's actually very interesting, isn't it? Because when grunge came along, then new metal, people became embarrassed about the keyboards and they started to disappear. And now, well, now there's no, there's no self-consciousness about using keyboards and melodic rock has taken its own path. And I guess your former band, Europe, they've decided to go a slightly different direction. They're kind of a bit more kind of deep purpley now. Whereas you're, yeah. you know, I listened to that song, Up To You, and that, that is one song that could have been on you know, the Out of This World album and you wouldn't, you wouldn't have missed a beat. Um, right. So, there's no, how did that period affect you when people started to try to make you feel wussy for uh, liking keyboards and liking melodies and liking big soaring courses? But I took it very personal because I'm a keyboard player too. You know, I've been playing all the keyboards on my productions and, and, and all my solo albums and all of that. And uh, it, it was horrible. I, I hated the grunge thing because first of all, it killed my business. And secondly, it lasted for about 35 seconds. Then it was gone. So what good did it do really? You know, I, I couldn't see the, the good with it. I, I, thank God that, you know, Melodic Rock is coming, you know, coming back in, in different ways, like an underground firstly, and now it's getting slowly back to being mainstream again. So, uh, but obviously I hated the idea of not having keyboards in, in my music, but so I did anyway, but mm -hmm. in, in slightly different way from my solo album from 2002, I think it is, mm -hmm. Melon and Divine. It's full of keyboards, but it's in a slightly different way. Because back then, people, you know, started to look at you funny, funny if you had keyboards on your, your song. Yeah. So it was a different era altogether. I hated that era. <laughs> the mid 90s to 2000 something was just a, it's a, it's a dark spot in my past. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's great now because fans, I guess there were actually times also for fans where they, they were made to feel guilty going to watch that band or going to listen to that uh, music. And, and now there's, they're, 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 they're kind of, um, I guess they kind of um, uh, let their passion run free again now, haven't they? They're, they're not ashamed that they like this sort of music. In fact, the whole industry has built up once more around um, this type of music. I'm, I'll, I'll say that and I'll ask the next question. How did this album come to be released in Japan first? Yeah, first of all, I mean, I meet record company executives and A&Rs all the time. I, I travel, I have meetings with them in the States and in Europe and whatnot. And I always get the same rap uh, for decades now. Key, you're a great songwriter, great producer, but the kind of music you want to do is impossible to sell. And uh, uh, it always ends the same. I tell them to fuck off and I keep on doing it. Uh, <laughs> but the thing is, I, I'm slowly been proven right, haven't I? I mean, I have, I don't know if for my solo career, but I have a song called, from my previous solo album called Don't Miss You Much. And it's actually a hit in Europe right now. It was number two in Russia, number one in Holland, number one in Austria. It's been on charts all over Europe. Uh, it's an AOR song. And I, I guess was, what this tells me is that there's a massive unmet need for this type of music, which is not simply not represented by the major labels. So people have to find, find it every other way possible, you know? But surely it's really hard to find it uh, on Spotify, a lot of hard rock, and, and, and melodic rock bands are very underrepresented at Spotify and digital medias, you know. So I hope that will change in the future. I mean, just look at Kiss, that's one of the biggest bands in the world. Their Spotify accounts are ridiculous. Even a hit like I, I Was Meant for Loving You, it has, you know, hundreds of millions, but I mean, come on, we're talking billions now. People like Ed Sheeran, they have billions of Spotify, on Spotify accounts. 
so it's ridiculous. I mean, I hope it's, I sincerely hope it's going to change. Yeah, we could talk about that. We could talk about that forever. I, I guess it's got a lot to do with what mediums people our age use, and you still got people who hold out now who yeah. say, I, I, I want vinyl or, or more. I want CDs, and we're kind of the only that narrow age band that actually were hanging on to CDs. And I guess we're hurting the. Um, the, the play counts of our, of our favorite artists, aren't we, you know? Yeah, but to answer your question, what happened then, we thought, you know, why did we release in Japan for it? I mean, yes, we thought, you know, instead of trying to, you know, do this round with the major labels and get this, getting the same answer, you know, it's gonna be difficult, you know, fuck off. You know, we said, why don't we do a crowdfunding campaign? You know, we can cater directly to the fans. And I think we, we could do that. So we did that. We did this crowdfunding campaign, great campaign with the CD, a live CD and, and uh, four different colors, vinyls, beautiful packages you can buy and all that. But once doing that, what came first, the chicken or the egg, one of those. So people started calling us and wanted to release labels, started to release the thing. And one of them, one of the labels in Japan was JVC Victor, and I worked with them obviously with Europe, but also other projects over the years. So I really liked them, and they picked it up. So we figured we can do Japan first, and then we do the rest of the world. And JVC did an amazing job. Number one on the album charts, and we pretty much dominated the album charts that, from April until summer, you know. Uh, so that was great. And then we were talking about the rest of the world, pretty much the same problem, who we're gonna approach. And then we, our manager, Nick Crofta, got in, in touch with these guys that were going to form this label, Atomic Fire. And we knew it was the Nuclear Blast guys. The yeah. only bummer was we had to keep this a secret for almost nine months because they were not gonna be able to release our album until January. So we knew this all along. So it's been, it's been held, you know, journalists have been calling me, your album is killing it in, in Japan. Why is it available all over the planet? And I had to say, I'll tell you later, because, <laughs> you know, I, I, I had like a, a vow of silence. We couldn't mention this until it was official, which it is now. So I guess now I can say January 14th, watch out MFs. <laughs> Welcome back to um, uh, White Line Fever, second part of an interview with Key Marcelo. I want to thank him uh, for being with us and for those watching, as always, thanks for not turning us off. That's uh, awesome. Um, Key, I, we're talking about your, uh, your new project, uh, Out of This World. I, ju I just wondered, um, you know, you had Ron Neverson um, um, uh, mix it and produce it, is that right? Now, Ron Neverson, you know- No, produced I produced it. I produced it. The, you produced the, it, sorry. But Ron, Ron mixed it. Right, you know, and he is. This is his specialty. This sound, isn't it? This kind of um, um, this you know, keyboard kind of heavy um, hard rock. That and and oh yeah. Why does he do it so well? Why does he record it so well? I mean, um, Kiss fans out there would remember him doing Crazy Nights, which was a massive, massive hit. Um, uh, well, Love why it. does he do it so well? Yeah, it's it's really a good question. I I actually asked him that, and. It, it, he says, no, I'm doing nothing. I'm just leveling, you know, it's a leveling my ass. You, you see some magic in your fingers. I mean, something's happening because you can hear everything crispy clear, like you're in the room. How do you do that even? There's so many mixers out, mixer guys out there, like uh, I'm not gonna mention by name, that makes everything sound like a mess, like a compressed limited turd of flat lining, you know, <laughs> which is, I, I hate uses like that. Personally, I'm not, I hate people limiting the crap out of productions because I'm not interested in hearing what the lead singer had for breakfast. I want to hear lights and shadows, dynamics. The verse goes down and then it's powerful crescendo after the solo, whatever. Some stuff got to happen to me, otherwise it's not music. So uh, when I called Ron, I said, uh, we have some stuff here. I think it's right after your alley. We have a, had a couple of guys having a go at it, but I'm not happy. And he said, Key, just drop box me the files for the song of your choice and I'll have a go and send it right back to you. And the next day we got an MP3 with a mix that completely blew our heads clean off. It was amazing. It did Twilight. 
and it sounded exactly like it sounded in my dreams when I when I started recording, but better, of course. And you could hear everything crispy clear. So it's heavy, it's loud, it's rocking. I mean, I don't know how he does it. I have no idea. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, even though you've done eight or ten interviews in the last day with in Australia, there's probably people watching who've never seen you interviewed before. So I probably should ask a question or two um, for them. And one of my favorite home videos as a kid, well, I don't know, I think I was old enough to get it for free, actually, a review copy, so it's dating me, was Europe in America. Um, um, and I, I mean, we all wondered back then, we were watching that home video and watching the music videos, you know, what it was like to be at the center of that. Um, so, so for someone who couldn't imagine what it was like, um, can, I, I mean, we've got but the Beatles uh, documentary on recently. How, how would you sum it up? And I guess uh, allied to that, what was it like when it was all over? What was it, how did you, how did you come to the realization that those um, days were over and what was that like to deal with? Well, I would guess when, uh, the sensation of it being over was when grunge came. Yeah. Because the thing is not only did grunge come and change uh, the, the game plan completely, but also uh, a lot of people that you know were totally into this kind of music that I love, they were keeping, they, they were kept hostage with somebody pointing the grunge gun at them. You <laughs> simply had to say, yeah, I love Nirvana. Yeah, I really like this new stuff, but they didn't mean it from the heart. You know, it was so, I've got thousands of examples of people just changed their pants to grunge pants from one night to another. And it was just ridiculous to watch it in LA. I was living in LA at the time and from overnight, basically, people changed from, you know, tore up jeans and, and uh, Hawaii shirts to turtlenecks and posh. What the fuck's wrong with you? What happened? Get a fucking grip. You know, this is, this is, this is not happening, but it did. And it totally, and I'm, around that time, I moved back to, to Stockholm then, you know, I'm in Gothenburg now, but I moved back, moved back to Sweden. And uh, it really, that whole thing really made me feel like it was over. But still being recognized because I'm like a household name in Sweden. So everybody could still ridicule me and, and mock me for being so obsolete. <laughs> So was that was that kind of like um, was it? Ha, what impact did that have on your relationship with the rest, you know, of the band? I know they went away for quite a while and then came back, but um, did, yeah, did the grunge I mean, actually impact your personal relationships as well, or not? Not really, because business wise, wise we were killing it. I mean, Princess in Paradise sold well to this day two million, I think. But it's if you sell over a million units, every major label that doesn't want to you know, doesn't want to have a new album or, 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 or you know, that's malpractice. So they wanted, a, they wanted a Princess in Paradise too, obviously. You know, they don't give a shit about trends. They don't, they only care about cash. Mm. They don't give a fuck about music. Cash is all they want. And they saw this album is killing it on the charts. It's selling like hell. We want another one. So they started asking us, you know, when when can you do it and all that. And we, we started talking about it, and we agree musically for us. We're in a different situation here. We don't we care about music. So what are we gonna do in 1992-93 in the era of grunge? What can we possibly contribute to the music scene right now without being ridiculed? And we came to the conclusion let's take a break and that's what happened and then the break was really long and from 92 93 till 2000 we did a reunion game at the millennium night you know but i mean we kept in contact not all the time but it was no hard feelings i mean we had one thing in common we all hated the grunge era <laughs> <laughs> So and here we are. Here we are. You, you've um, you, you um, out on your I'm own. I'm back. And, yeah, big, very, very. Okay, everybody, welcome back to White Line TV. If you're listening, if you're watching, uh, I'm glad you're still watching. Uh, we're back with Key Marcelo, third part of our interview um, with him. 
Uh, we've been talking about his, uh, his new project, Out of This World, which, as, we, as you probably know, is named after the Europe album of the same name. I wanted to ask you about a couple of things that have been, have been in the news uh, there, Key. One is Ronnie from Pretty Maids and working with him on his album. That had to have been a, um, a moving experience, a challenging experience, an emotional experience. How oh, because he's very uh, ill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 horrible, man. And I, I uh, he's in my brain. He's absolutely mad. What what a great singer! What a great guy! And it, it was just a. It, I know he decided to make a solo album because he more or less thought it's now or never in a way, you know, and of various reasons, and one being very obvious. And and uh, when he asked me to play in the record, it was not no shadow of a doubt I wanted to do it. I'm really happy to be a part of that. Yeah, I'm just hoping he can get cured from this and, and keep on rocking. Like he's been rocking. He's been, he's my, I'm proud to be his Scandinavian rock brother. Yeah, yeah. Um, we all wish him uh, uh, the best. And and in, in these interviews, um, you know, you, you often get asked about other musicians and you talk about, you know, being friends with, you know, Don Airy and being friends with all these people. Don Airy plays on the album. But I wondered if you ever run into and um, and have a relationship with Brett Michaels and C.C. DeVille. Do you ever run into them? <laughs> no. You know what? It's so funny. I'm, I get this question a lot. It's so funny because I, 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 I got contact with the, um, the producer of Poison's album, and what, uh, Rick, Rick Brady, yeah. Rick Brady, and and uh, he told me he brought the East Action album and the Hanor Hanor Rocks album to the the studio when they did the the Poison album, and he he put on We Go Rocking and suggested the band make a cover out of it, and they said it's a fucking Swedish glam band, who's gonna know? And they just ripped us off, and this is a and I, this is Rick Brady personally saying this. So it's so fucking obvious that it happened. And for me, it would have been, if it would have been me doing such a mistake, I would say, I'm so sorry, I fucked up. Man, I, I took your song. I'm so sorry. I'm going to make it up to you. Uh, no pun intended. <laughs> I swear I'll make it up. <laughs> anyway. Uh, You're on fire. <laughs> yeah, I'm on fire. But anyway, uh, uh, to this day, believe it or not, they completely, bluntly deny it. When, when Poison played at Sweden Rock Festival, they had a press conference and they, somebody asked, or a lot of people asked, what about Key Marcello? What about Easy Action? What about We Go Rocking? You know? Mm -hmm. And he said, never heard of any of those. Mm -hmm. You know? And that was the end of it. And, and people tried to go on, but he just bluntly denied it. And it's so ridiculous, you know, if, if you at least agree you're wrong sometimes so i don't know i don't want to see those assholes they... <laughs> you know, because when twisted sister recently sued the australian politician clive palmer over we're not going to take it it was it was their record company right they saw no money from the action is do you own the catalog of the easy action stuff um and would did you do you benefit from any um uh, legal action or does is it is the publishing owned by somebody else Oh no! Well, the the publisher is Warner Chapel Music, but but I I think I'm hundred percent on this. No, no, actually I'm hundred percent on the music, and and there's three of us in the lyrics: the the, the singer, the bass player, and me. And we are rocking. But I mean, there's there's money there. I'm, the thing with I was so busy when this happened. I didn't sue them. It was Warner Chapel Music that sued right. them, and took them and and threatened to take them to court. It was really a dumb deal. I wonder why they didn't do that. Instead, they made a settlement out of the court. But as you know, when you, when you do a settlement, uh, uh, you don't, they don't have to agree to that doing to any wrongdoing. Mm -hmm. So if we would have been taking them to court, I would have been co-writer on their mm -hmm. song, which I think it would have been fair. Mm -hmm. You know, so every time they do a co and, that's how you admit you've been doing something wrong. Yeah. Because every time they do a, a, a best of Poison album and the song is on there, some money goes to me. It doesn't now. We just got this sum of money, you know, a settlement out of court. 
And if I would have been more plugged into the whole uh, thing, I should have, uh, I, if it's one regret I have, is not dragging their sorry asses to court. Yes, I saw that quote, it's a good quote. Um, before we leave, because as I said, I appreciate your time, Key, this morning, and I'll let you get back out into the, hopefully, the Gothenburg sunshine or the snow or whatever it's like. Outside. Winter wonderland, man. Yes, winter, winter wonderland. I, I wonder if the, after the apocalypse we have a nuclear winter wonderland. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, I wanted to um, good at the moment we we have um, um, you know um, George Lynch opens for Dokken. There's all these different examples. You know where I'm going with this. It would would could um, out of this world actually play on the same bill as Europe? Could you could you tour together? It's a, a same group of fans. I imagine it'd be an, an attractive package. Could it happen? Yeah. Why not? It's mm. not a good. I never thought about it until you mentioned it now. But that's a great idea. Mm. It's the same type of music, and it would definitely make sense, you know. I, I, and I can go on stage and play the superstitious solo, you know, instead of listening to Nora make an ass of himself every time I'm tempted to do that. <laughs> You're giving me plenty of stuff for blabbermouth here. Um, so what are the touring plans of, uh, of Out of This World? Um, have you got any touring plans? I mean, obviously, a, a no-brainer would be to go to Japan since we were so successful with the album there, number one in the album charts and all that. And while there, why not go to Australia to go to Australia? That would be a, a dream come true. I, I've never been. You know, we had a tour with Europe booked in Australia, but it got cancelled for some reason. I don't know why. And uh, so I definitely want to do that. And we have, I mean, we want to do all the big festivals this coming summer. But everything depends on the COVID situation. Mm. I hate this COVID shit. I hope it's over soon. <laughs> <laughs>